Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Megan Ames, and I'm a representative of the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I'd like to welcome you to the fourth breastfeeding educational webinar for healthcare providers. Today, you'll hear the presentation, Assessment and Management of the Tongue-Tied Infant. This program is part of the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene Hospital Breastfeeding Policies Physician Webinar Series. After completing this presentation and successfully completing a post-test, physicians will receive one hour of continuing medical education. This CME will be available through June 2019. DHMH thanks LifeBridge Health and Dr. Dana Silver for partnering with us to make this possible. Per DHMH policy, we remind our listening audience of the recommended steps to reduce contracting the Zika virus, which can cause serious birth defects. Citizens are advised to avoid mosquito bites, use insect repellent, and empty containers of standing water. This slide pictures the species of mosquito that spreads the Zika virus, and here are websites that you can access to find more information. I now want to move on to our presentation. Dr. Dana Silver is a general pediatrician and head of the Division of General Pediatrics at the Herman and Walter Samuelson Children's Hospital at Sinai in Baltimore. She received her B.S. from Cornell University in 1987 and her M.D. from University of Maryland in 1991. She then completed residency and chief res re residency at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital in Cleveland. Dr. Silver has been a fellow of the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine since 2013. She lectures extensively across the Mid-Atlantic region on breastfeeding and has worked on advocacy and legislative issues including the use of donor human milk in Maryland's NICUs and insurance coverage of breast pumps. She is currently serving as treasurer of the Maryland Breastfeeding Coalition and breastfeeding coordinator for the Maryland chapter of the Academy of Pediatrics. Thank you again, Dr. Silver. We look forward to your presentation. All right, I'm a go. You can all hear me, correct? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, welcome, everyone, and I'll get started. Um, okay, I have nothing to disclose. Um, by the end of this, I'd like for everybody to um, certainly know how to identify tongue tie, and ankyloglossy is a big word, so I'm going to be using the word tongue tie, um, but also really get a feel for um, the challenges in um, not only in, in the, the problems that it can cause, but also the challenge that I think it tends to be overdiagnosed. We see it and we assume that just because there's this anatomic difference that it's going to cause problems. And so I, I'd like everyone to, to kind of get a better feel for that. And then we'll go over about phrenotomies and their pros and cons. So in order to talk about tongue tie and its effects on breastfeeding, I think we need to do a quick review of latch and positioning. When a mom is breastfeeding, it's really important that she's comfortable. We don't want her waving her breast around and twisting and everything else. Same thing with the baby. The infant's head should be in straight line with the body, tummy to tummy or chest to chest, just parallel to the mom. And again, the mom has to be comfortable. Because when she's tense, the baby's going to tense up. Mom stimulates the rooting reflex, usually by taking that nipple and, and stroking the top of the baby's lip. And then when the baby's mouth is wide open, the idea is that the baby takes sufficient areola into the mouth. And you can see um, the nice fish lips, we call it, or the very wide angle of the mouth. This is a nice schemata. If you see the nipple here, it's touching the um, right, or it should aim to touch between the hard palate, soft palate junction. Uh, and, and that's where the baby's going to be able to maximize the milk withdrawal, and you can see the this is the baby's tongue, and is ideally on the areola and not on the tip of the nipple. Wide open mouth, the chin is in a little bit more than the upper part. The moms are always worried about the baby getting smothered, but the chin's in, the nose has that little space to breathe. And you can see the difference between these two. This is, baby has a very narrow corner of the mouth. You can see um, that the baby's pretty much on the nipple, that mom's going to get very sore compared to this baby here. So what happens if the baby doesn't latch on well or um, consistently doesn't latch on well is the mom gets really sore. All the moms are going to get sore in the first few days, particularly if they're a primip. 
but they're sore and then they're sore. And what we don't want is for them to get so sore that they are dreading feeding or that they stop feeding. So early onset of sore nipples is almost always due to poor latch and positioning. And so really it's so important that the moms get the help in the hospital, get seen very um, soon within 24 to 48 hours of discharge, and have people working with them to make sure this baby is latching on correctly. Late onset of sore nipples might be due to various problems. Uh, might be due to poor latch. Might mom who has a history of eczema or psoriasis might have problems there. Might be acute her herpes infection on the nipple, which we all know is a, a true contraindication to the baby feeding at that time on that breast. Candida, mastitis, and moms can also get a Raynaud's type phenomenon on their nipples. But what you can see in this um, picture on the left is there's cracking um, at the uh, tip of the nipple and then cracking on the base of the nipple. And I, uh, um, and that could be, again, from poor latch is the most common thing. But what can happen after extended time and not latching well is that, I don't know if you can appreciate, kind of the yellowish kind of honey crusting at the tip of the nipple and again at the base of the nipple. And uh, this may be due to a bacterial infection, candida, et cetera. So what do you do with sore nipples? You fix the latch, and that's the most important thing. We used to recommend dry heat healing, meaning just leave the nipples open to air, but of course then every time the baby latched on, that scab would be pulled off. So moist healing is really the way to go. And that can be from lanolin, as long as the mom's not allergic to, to wool. Uh, moisture retaining occlusive dressings like hydrogel, and they sell these even in, in Target and other uh, stores. Express milk, breast milk if they're just mildly irritated and let that dry on the breast. Uh, and then considering an antibiotic ointment, we're going to get back to that. Moms who are sore may also benefit from manual expression before feeding to soften that areola or even pumping and feeding in a bottle or a cup until healed. And I put a question mark next to nipple shield. So I don't know if you can tell in the upper picture, there's a little thin, clear shield on this uh, mom's breast. And they look come in various types. Again, you can buy them in department stores. Uh, you can buy them online. And they're these little silicone shields with holes at the tip. And you want to make sure that um, the nipple fits in well, that it's not uh, being jammed in there so that it fits, that the mom gets the right size. I, I don't resort to nipple shields often. Um, sometimes people will see it as a quick fix to get that baby latched on, but then it doesn't teach a baby how to latch well. But I do use it in situations where a mom is really so sore um, that she's ready to stop uh, while we work to heal those nipples up. Many of you have heard of triple nipple cream or Dr. Jack Newman's all-purpose nipple ointment. He's a Canadian physician. And uh, this is, and, and a lot of pharmacies make this. Um, mupiracin, a topical antifungal, and a topical um, steroid, a pretty potent topical steroid. And the directions are to apply sparingly after each feed. Um, and then the, if the baby goes to feed, the mom doesn't have to wash her breast. If there's like a little clump of the ointment, mom can wipe it off. But it is not significantly absorbed through the GI tract. This is frequently prescribed. I see it in my hospital. I see these moms who are just you know, one or two days out being discharged from the hospital on this all-purpose nipple ointment. And the question is, is it really effective and is it really needed? Well, there's not that much data out there. There was a um, one fairly large study a couple of years ago in Breastfeeding Medicine, which is the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine Journal. And there was a double-blind randomized study of 151 breastfeeding women who had damaged nipples. And they received either just lanolin or the all-purpose nipple ointment. There was no significant difference in mean pain at a week or in breastfeeding duration and exclusivity at 12 weeks. So what do we do? Again, with sore nipples, fix the latch, fix the latch, fix the latch um, is really key. What I, I do want to encourage you all to do is think about and address the cause before treating blindly with something so broad as APNO. So consider just using lanolin if the nipples are sore, especially in the first week. Cracked or crusted um, um, nipples, you might consider just a topical antibiotic. I sometimes will just use bacitracin or mupiracin and either a nonstick pad or I'll even use like saran wrap, plastic wrap, um, as, a, as a cheap way because a lot of my families are, are low income and may not have insurance. Um, I might consider adding an antifungal down the line if there's considers, con concerns about candida. But again, in the first few days, I would not 
expect candida. I do sometimes use topical steroids. Sometimes I'll just use hydrocortisone ointment, um, but I may use something stronger if there's a strong history of eczema or psoriasis or something else. But I don't resort to the APNO very often anymore, and I do find that I'm getting the same outcomes. So let's now jump to the topic at hand, which is tongue tie. I don't know about you all, but I know that when I was going through medical school, I'd never even heard of this. Um, of course, I didn't get much training in breastfeeding either. And same thing in residency. This was not something I encountered. Uh, this is an article from um, 2007, and uh, it, they surveyed pediatricians, ENTs, and, and lactation consultants, and they found that about 90% of pediatricians and 70% of ENTs at that time believed that tongue tie rarely caused feeding difficulties. And yet the opposite. 70% of lactation consultants believed that it frequently caused feeding difficulties, and an additional 30% believed it occasionally caused feeding difficulties. So there's a, a real difference, and I think that's where uh, we're seeing this, is that as a physician, I'm getting many lactation consultants referring to me for tongue tie, and that's OK. Um, but I want us all to be on the same page and recognize it um, and be able to identify those that are really, truly affecting a baby and those that may not. What's interesting is around the turn of the 20th century, phrenotomies were routinely performed in the past by midwives and OBs. Um, uh, there was a, I've read that midwives often had their pinky fingernail grown long so that they could just kind of slice that little membrane when the baby was born. But certainly, we can do it better nowadays. So what is tongue tie? It's a complete or partial fusion of the lingual frenulum to the floor of the mouth. So you may see decreased length, lack of elasticity. You may have an attachment too distal beneath the tongue or too close to or onto the gingival ridge. And it's an embryologic remnant. So I talked to my parents um, of patients about this. So the tongue starts fused to the bottom of the mouth in utero and then slowly separates. It's frequently familial. I always ask these parents who else has tongue tie. And it's very common that the mom, the dad, and uncle, somebody had it. It can be associated with a high arch palate, with retro or micronathia, with pronathism, and possibly with hypotonia. And that would make sense if the tongue is not moving around much in the mouth, or if it, it can't lift up because you have a really high arch palate, you may see more of this embryologic remnant. This is the largest study looking at the prevalence of tongue tie. Uh, this is from uh, Pediatrics in 2002. They looked at 2,700 consecutive breastfeeding inpatients, so all babies born on this inpatient unit over a period of time, and 273 outpatient infants with breastfeeding problems. So these were patients that were referred to the breastfeeding clinic who were having problems. And they assessed using a tool that we're going to go over, and also maternal ratings of pain. Um, and they found about 3.2% of inpatients, so these are of all babies, and about 12.8% of babies that are having problems um, in their outpatient breastfeeding clinic had uh, tongue tie. The average prevalence seen in other studies has been from about 1.7 to 4.8%, so I usually say about 3% on average. The short and long-term complications we worry about, certainly we're going to talk about the breastfeeding issues. A lot of parents worry about speech difficulties as the child gets older. I am not going to clip the tongue of a bottle-fed baby or a breastfed baby that is feeding well if they have tongue tie. Just because I worry about speech issues down the road, I'm going to send that to somebody as they get older. Um, I, the age will vary depending on the severity. Dentists uh, and oral surgeons are often concerned that uh, these tongue-tied babies, as they get older, may develop malocclusion, may have swallowing difficulties, and do have some concerns about obstructive sleep apnea and gastroesophageal reflux. The idea is you know, try swallowing with your tongue stuck to the base of your mouth. And then there's the social cosmetic thing. If you can't stick your tongue out, you can't like an ice cream cone or a lollipop. Um, if your tongue is forked, then people may have the um, concerns. This is a study from the proceedings of the National Academy of Sci Science a couple, uh, two years ago. And there have been a lot of studies out in the last 10 years using ultrasound images during breastfeeding. They, they put the ultrasound probe up under the baby's chin, and, uh, which I think is really cool. So um, in a normal breastfeeding baby, what they find is the anterior tongue 
is wedged between the nipple areola complex and the lower lip, and it moves as a rigid body with the cycling motion of the mandible. And it also moves, that tongue moves a bit anteriorly outside of the mouth as the mouth opens. So this may be part of the issue if the tongue is tied and it can't stick out. That may be one of the issues. And then during nursing, the posterior tongue undulates like peristaltic waves to push that milk back to swallow. And again, if you can't lift the posterior tongue, that may be an issue. There were previous ultrasound studies by Gettys, in two, uh, this one was from 2008, that showed that during successful breastfeeding, you do not get much distortion of the nipple. Uh, a lot of these babies that are not latching on well, you'll find when they come off that the nipple is very distorted, flattened, that sort of thing. Um, and that certainly for successful breastfeeding, you need to generate a vacuum to draw the milk out via negative pressure. So in this schemata, um, you can see this is a, a baby that does not have tongue tie. You can see it's it's not great because this baby's not really back on the areola, but you can see the tongue comes out. And then you can see uh, down below kind of this peristaltic motion to, to move the milk. In this baby, there's uh, the tongue cannot come out. So again, they're just chomping on the nipple. And then if you can't, if you have some posterior component, then they may not be able to do that posterior, that, that peristaltic motion. Um, there are some babies where you stick your finger in and you just, you just feel almost like them them chomping instead of that nice peristaltic wave. There's a couple of different classifications of tongue tie, and um, uh, this is the one that's seen the most commonly. So a type 1 is the classic heart shape of the tongue. That baby can't lift it. Um, the at attachment of the frenulum is to the tip of the tongue, and then uh, on terms of its attachment to the alveolar, it's usually in front of the alveolar ridge in the lower lip sulcus. A type 2 is a little bit behind the tip of the tongue, and the frenulum on the bottom attaches on or just behind the alveolar ridge. And types 1 and 2 make up about 70 to 75 percent of most of the tongue ties we see. Types 3 and 4 are a little harder to identify, and uh, type 3 is the attachment to the middle of the tongue and the middle of the floor of the mouth. It's usually tighter and less elastic, and type 4 is against the base of the tongue. It's often thick and shiny and very inelastic. And, and these are where there's a lot of controversy, especially type 4s. Um, I'll often have babies refer to me that feeling that there may be a posterior tongue tie component. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more how to identify them. But the other thing is, you know, it's not, it may not always be a posterior tongue tie, or if it is, it may not always need a procedure. Um, some of these babies have poor oral motor coordination or really tight jaws, and, and um, if you can find a good occupational therapist or somebody who can help work with them, sometimes that will help, or a lactation consultant who's knowledgeable. I'm not saying they don't need a procedure, but not all of them do. So types 3 and 4 may require a digital exam to identify. And again, some babies may be able to breastfeed, and others will have trouble. Here are some other pictures of tongue tie. Again, identifying posterior tongue tie, just some other ways to look for it, because you want to look not just at how it looks, but how it functions. So these babies may not be able to stick their tongue fully out, any of these tongue-tied babies. Um, or they can only stick their tongue out when the mouth is cl partially closed. They can't lift the tongue to the top of the mouth. Or they can only lift the tongue up when the mouth is mostly closed. They may not be able to fully twist or turn sideways. They, you can't get your finger under the tongue. I'm going to talk about that. And when they cry, the edges curl up, but they can't lift that tongue up. There's another approach to, to identifying tongue tie, and, and I, I kind of look at all of these pieces. Uh, it's called the Murphy Maneuver off after Jim Murphy, uh, who's a pediatrician. And so if you rub your finger under the, tongue, under, the, um, under the tongue side to side, so on the floor of the mouth, if there's no resistance or a small speed bump, in general, that may not, it, you know, there shouldn't be much of a problem. If you feel kind of this taut piano wire, you have to push your finger into it, and you push your finger into it, the tongue may kind of tilt down instead of tilting up. That may be an issue. You might feel a fence where you kind of sweep your finger across, and you have to kind of jump over the fence to get to the other side. Or you may hit like a tree trunk, this thick, inelastic, very restrictive type. 
One other thing that I look at with posterior tongue tie, or just with any function of the tongue, is you may not see the frenulum as much, but um, when the baby's crying, instead of the tongue staying nice and thick, you can see that this baby, that how thick that tongue is, because the bottom is being tethered, and the baby's trying really hard to lift the tongue up. So it looks very thickened, and they can't open their mouth wide while they're crying. So how does it present if it's symptomatic? Poor latch and suck um, may be the biggest issue, leading to moms getting very sore. You may have babies that do not um, transfer milk well uh, because they're not deep on that areola, and so they get frustrated and they arch away. But again, there's lots of reasons babies can get frustrated and arch away. Arch away. They may have difficulty establishing suction to maintain a deep grasp on the breast. So sometimes with these babies, I'll hear a clicking sound like a um, because they can't keep suction. And I'll even see it if they're bottle feeding, too, is that they can't keep suction, or they may gradually slide off the breast. Or you may see more chewing of the nipple. And so what happens? The babies get frustrated um, down the road. They may not be gaining weight at the, the rate we want. Um, moms may get very sore. Their nipples may get infected. Their milk production may go down because they, um, the baby's just not emptying the breast like they should. And that leads to early weaning. This is just a, a, um, a look at infant's age at presentation with tongue tie. So the median age at presentation is lower for poor latch than for nipple pain. And it's usually within the first few days. So how do you assess? Well, the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine, if you all have not been there, I would encourage everybody to go to their website, which is um, BF med.org, and they have for free um, a whole series of protocols on everything bre related to breastfeeding. So they do have their ankyloglossia protocol, and it, it's very helpful. Um, so as a pediatrician, certainly when I do my newborn exam, whether in the hospital or in the, first in the office, I take a look at the mouth. And I'm not just looking for a cleft palate or things like that. So you want to look at everything. You want to palpate the hard and soft palate, the gingiva, and the sublingual areas. You want to observe the tongue, uh, its movement, length, elasticity, points of insertion, the sublingual frenulum. And ideally, watch breastfeeding. I get so much information from breastfeeding. And I ask mom, how does it feel? Does she feel suction? Does she um, report pain? And I take a look at mom's nipples if she's reporting pain. The um, the most popular assessment tool is uh, the Hazel Baker assessment tool for lingual frenulum function. And I'm going to go through this. I, I, I don't use it um, because over time I've kind of learned to look at the structure and function. But I think it's a good learning tool to look at all the different pieces. And the key is it's not just the look, it's the functionality. So um, the lower the score, the worse things are. And there is inter-rater reliability and validity with this. And, um, and there is a, it is highly correlated with difficulty with latch and maternal complaints of sore nipples. So, sorry, going back, she has five appearance items and seven function items. So the appearance items are, look at the tongue when lifted. You know, what does it look like? Is the tongue heart-shaped, like we talked about that tight type one, or is it round and square? And babies can have all or none of these things. Um, look at the elasticity of the frenulum. Is it loose and elastic, because then the baby may nurse just fine, or is it very tight and taut? Look at the length of the frenulum. If it's longer than a centimeter, the baby may not have as many issues. Look at the attachment of the frenulum to the tongue, um, and look at the attachment to the inferior alveolar ridge. So where is it placed? And then, the function items, which I find very helpful. So lateralization, can the tongue, you can kind of get the tongue moving side to side and, um, and tracing the lower gum ridge and brushing the lateral edge of the tongue. Can they, the tongue move side to side? Can the tongue lift? So when you take your finger out of the infant's mouth, or better yet, I, I have to admit, I hate to make babies cry, but I, I find it easier to assess things that way, is what does it look like when the baby's crying? Again, do you see that thick tongue? Do they have to close their mouth a bit to raise their tongue, that sort of thing. Can they stick their, uh, and then can they stick their tongue out? So you can bro uh, stroke the tongue and uh, downward toward the chin and see, can they get the tongue out? 
What does the tongue look like? Can it spread out when you're listening to the rooting reflex just before cupping? Um, does it thin nice and evenly? And a couple more things. Um, uh, measure to the degree to which the tongue hugs the fingers, the infant sucks on it. So can they get a good cupping around the finger? Can you feel that peristalsis, or is it more like chewing? And lastly, do you hear that snap backing or clip clicking sound where they can't maintain suction. I'm going to touch very quickly on um, the upper lip tie. I, I've just started looking for these. Um, and there is a lot of controversy out there as to whether this does indeed cause breastfeeding problems. Uh, so I think that in some babies it does. I think in some babies it doesn't. Um, I, so um, the upper lip tie is attachment of the upper lip to the maxillary gingival tissues. And it may prevent the upper lip from spreading up and out when latching at the breast. So these are the babies that kind of curl at the tip and, again, may have problems with suction. So I do always make sure that I look for it. They also have a classification system, class 1 and 2, usually don't cause many problems. Class 3 and 4, the frenulum inserts in the attached gingiva right between where the, the central incisors are going to erupt. That can certainly contribute to the large gap between the teeth. And another, and class 4 is where it kind of wraps around um, over the dental ridge. And that can severely inhibit the flanging of the lip and the baby's latch. So obviously, this is an older child. Um, but I, And I'm going to probably say this wrong, diastema, diastema. Um, but you can see how this is completely tethered. Um, here's another one that's very thick, more of a type 3. And so what are the issues? This is from uh, Dr. Robert Marcus, who is a dentist in our area and uh, does a lot of these procedures. Um, certainly, it can contribute to painful latch, baby popping off during nursing, that upper lip curling underneath. Um, with some of these moms, I find just practice and just having her learn to pull that upper lip out may be sufficient. And some need, need uh, correction. The, uh, concern as they get older is it limits access to the upper teeth for cleaning and contributes to dental caries and dental alignment issues. So here's just some examples from Dr. Marcus. Again, you can see pre-treatment and post-treatment um, that this gum is, is much more freed up or this lip is more freed up. OK, so I'm going to move on to t talking about how to treat tongue tie. Um, I'm not going to talk much about lip tie, but there will be a few more slides about that. So our, treat, our options are no treatment, observation, and support, or a phrenotomy. And that can be done either via scissors method or laser method. So about 10 years ago, um, I reached out to an ENT in the area, and he trained me on how to do it. Um, the way he trained me is actually a little different than what I do now. Uh, but I will say it is a very simple procedure. Uh, I think the hardest thing is deciding, oh dear, um, is deciding whether or not it needs to be done. So um, what do you need for the procedure? Well, you need um, iris scissors, or I will use blunt tip Metzenbaum scissors, but something with a short um, that are short. And then you need this thing called a grooved retractor. And uh, the groove retractor goes up under the tongue and helps lift it up. It's a very um, inexpensive tool. This is not a sterile procedure. Uh, but you do obviously need clean gloves. You need gauze, um, some gelatin foam uh, in case of prolonged bleeding, which I very, very, very rarely use. Um, and then a good light source, because obviously you need to be able to see. Parents need to be counseled about the risks and benefits and alternatives. Um, and the risks are bleeding, swelling. Infection is very unusual, because these are the mouth has lots of uh, good antibacterial enzymes. Um, but I always say that. And then the risk of scarring or, or re-adhesion. Um, and so we'll talk about that in a second. And counseling should always include a discussion of the possibility that the clinical breastfeeding problem will not necessarily improve, especially if it's been going on for a while. Um, many infants will have to relearn how to feed properly with the help of a lactation consultant or occupational therapist. Anesthesia, analgesia, the frenulum itself is almost devo um, devoid of sensory innervation. And unlike the rest of the mouth, um, this is an embryologic remnant, and there is not much, um, not many blood vessels there. So it does not tend to bleed a lot. I'm not being cavalier about that. Um, in general, 
infants less than four months can usually tolerate the procedure without uh, local anesthesia. What I use is a pacifier dipped in Sweeties, which is the sugary solution they use during circumcisions as well. Um, so uh, either pass so I have them suck on um, the Sweeties before and after the procedure. Um, some people will use topical benzocaine gel um, or viscous lidocaine or something. You don't want to overly numb the mouth because we want the baby to go to the breast right after. And certainly older babies may need other things. In my office, I don't do babies older than about six to eight weeks. Uh, certainly other people do older children, and, um, and there are ENTs and dentists who, who do older children. The infant is placed on the exam table or in mother's lap. Some people do it kind of knee to knee with the provider. Some people do it um, sitting next to the provider. I do it up on a table just because I get better lighting that way. Um, you can have the infant swall swaddled. I don't use a papoose immobilizer. Um, I have an assistant hold the baby's elbows against the ears. It just keeps the arms out of the way. And, and they use two fingers to help stabilize the chin. So you use this grooved retractor to go up. Here's the tongue. Here's the bottom of the mouth. And so I slide the grooved retractor in, and then I lift up. And what that does is give me a good visualization. And it also creates some hemostasis because it's nice and taut. So, um, and then you use the scissors and you cut down kind of around the middle, a little bit closer to the floor of the mouth. Oops, let me go back here. Um, and you snip. Um, and so I make some snips. I reposition the grooved retractor, lifting up again. And I make some more snips. And sometimes it's just a thin membrane at the front. Usually there's something a little bit thicker uh, past that. You obviously want to avoid the sublingual mucosa, the salivary ducts. Uh, so what happens is that I, I cut the thin membrane, and often there's a little bit of a thicker one behind that. And it, when you make a little cut there, you'll see a little diamond shape form. And then I use my fingers. And I was taught this by Dr. Marcus. And I just use my fingers, and I spread that widely. That prevents me from cutting too far back. Uh, so if you wanted to classify what types I do, I usually will do kind of a class 1, 2, but often kind of slightly class 3. Again, that thicker membrane towards the back, um, it, it opens up very nicely with once you kind of cut that first thick tissue, and you can just spread it widely. It's hard to tell. There's some other pictures, but there's a little bit of a diamond shape here. Um, the bleeding is usually minimal. I put some pressure with a 2 by 2 gauze and um, usually stops within just a couple of minutes. Uh, if it persists, you can use gel foam um, and remove that after the bleeding stops. And then I take the baby and return them right to mom to be put to the breast. Because when they're nursing, pressure is going to further tamponade any other bleeding. Um, and a lot of these moms really anecdotally will say, oh my god, that's a completely different feeling. They'll say, I feel the suction, um, the pain is less. Not always, but it really can make a, an immediate difference in how the baby nurses. There are exercises that babies that I instruct babies, moms to do with their babies after, and usually starting the next day, stroking the base of the tongue to the tip um, to help maintain separation of the edges of the surgical site, and also to help the baby learn to extend the tongue, especially if the baby is older. As these are healing, just like as a circumcision heals, you'll get this yellowish, fibrinous exudate um, on the mucosal surface of the tip of the penis. You may see that under the surface of the tongue, and I warn the parents as well. And that goes away within about a week. Uh, just a few comments about the laser technique. I don't do that. Um, it vaporizes the tissue. Uh, they are certainly a little well, according to um, others, there are more precise bactericidal, reduced post-op pain, swelling, and bleeding. I don't have enough personal experience to know about that. Um, and the tissue is removed, so theoretically, the risk of reattachment is less. Here's just some examples of uh, this was a tongue tie release. And you can see a little better kind of that triangle shape there of releasing the tongue. Here is um, a lip tongue tie. This was used this the laser as well. So do you clip or don't you clip? And how much to clip? So I'm often consulted in the newborn nursery about these babies who are having trouble latching or whatever. And the question is, do I clip them now because I suspect this is going to cause problems or because the mom's already having nipple 
pain, or do I wait and see? And it really is, uh, it, it really is a case by case basis. Um, I think what I always say is you don't want to confuse functionality with appearance. And so you have to look at that big picture. I've worked uh, enough with our lactation consultants in the hospital that we work well together and they're really pretty good at identifying the babies that need my evaluation. Uh, but even then, I probably do not clip about a third of the ones that I see. And, and so it's really you know, watching um, the breastfeeding, watching the d dynamic interaction of the mom and the baby is really so key. Uh, there are some that I clip in the nursery uh, because I can just see it's very tight. I can anticipate the problems it's going to have. I, I discuss the risks and benefits with the parents. But many of them I'll say, here's my card. Let's watch it over the next few days. You get the support you need from lactation consultants and everybody. And if it's still a problem, then I will clip. So again, early treatment, the improvements may be wrongly attributed to the procedure. And later treatments, many mothers already have sore nipples and have given up. And that's what we don't want. So I don't have a quick answer. Um, the AHRQ in 2015 did a comparative effectiveness review of the treatment of tongue tie. And they looked at neonates and infants with tongue tie and tight frenu labial frenulum, so lip ties, and breastfeeding difficulties. And what they were looking for, surgical versus non-surgical interventions, intermediate outcomes in terms of mom's nipple pain, ability to latch, tongue mobility, and then final outcomes in terms of duration of breastfeeding, failure to thrive, infant weight gain, and oral and oropharyngeal dysphagia. So what they found were 29 studies out there. Three were good quality, and one was fair quality, randomized control studies. And basically, some evidence suggests that maternally reported breastfeeding outcomes improved, but the data is unavailable to assess the durability effects of effects. And there's a lack of consistent objective measures to define and classify tongue tie, which limits reproducibility of findings. Um, and so in most of these, the degree of tongue tie was not reported in studies. So obviously, future research is needed in this. This is just one of the studies that um, they reviewed that they found was a good study. And I just thought it was interesting. I wanted to um, show it. So it was a small study. They looked at just 25 infants with tongue tie. Again, they did not identify the type of tongue tie. And they were randomly assigned to phrenotomy. And then they went back to breastfeeding. Uh, the mom nursed them. And then they had a sham procedure where they took the baby out of the room and pretended to do something and brought the baby back in and mom breastfed. And then the other half had the sham procedure first breastfed, phrenotomy, breastfed. And the surgeons were blinded to the evaluations, and the mothers and personnel were blinded to the procedure. So it was really an interesting uh, approach to it. And the pain scores on a 1 to 10 scale significantly decreased after phrenotomy, um, whether, um, whenever the phrenotomy was done. And one other ultrasound study uh, from Gettys in 2009. And these are babies who had identified tongue tie and were successfully breastfeeding. So again, some babies with tongue tie can successfully breastfeed. So they looked at that submental ultrasound of five successfully breastfeeding tongue tied infants, and they three, you know, did have weak vacuums. Two had compression of the nipple, one at the tip, and one at the base, and yet all were able to extract sufficient milk. So we know that it's this again dynamic interaction between maternal breast and nipple and aspects of the tongue's movement that affects breastfeeding success in these babies. And so if we don't have to do a procedure and we can work with them to adjust how they're nursing or moms can figure it out, um, you know, a mom who has um, a very flat nipple may have more problem with a baby who can't move their tongue than maybe a mom who has a larger nipple. Um, a mom who has breastfed before may have, you know, or has a large milk supply, may breastfeed a lot more successfully. It, you really have to look at that dynamic inter interaction. So um, in wrapping up, so my key take takeaway point is that tongue tie is the cause of some, but not all cause causes of breastfeeding problems. And assessing the tongue tie's impact requires a thorough assessment of breastfeeding and milk transfer, not just latch and not just looking at the oral cavity. You want to consider supportive interventions prior to surgery, and you want to consider just um, maybe even clipping just the anterior part, and then maybe considering the posterior part later. However, that said, phrenotomy is a simple low-risk procedure. Um, relatively low risk, um, you know, nothing's without risk, but it is minor bleeding. It's a quick and simple procedure that can be performed by trained individuals, including you. You can certainly get trained. 
So what's needed? Well, we certainly need a uniform definition and grading of ankyloglossia. We need better research on the effects of timing of phrenotomies and on success and duration of breastfeeding. And we need research on non-surgical interventions, whether that's, again, occupational therapy or massage or, or whatever. Um, we do need some research on that. And then here are my references. All right, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Silver. That was an incredibly comprehensive presentation. And um, if there are questions at this time, uh, we would open the floor to our participants. Um, Dr. Dana, I have two questions that I've assigned to you. OK, so let's see. Oh, well, the, one, the first question is, where we'll be getting a copy of the presentation? Um, so that's you all need to answer. I can address that. Uh, we will be posting recordings of this and the other five presentations on the, um, the Maryland Department of Health and Mental Hygiene website. And I'll actually be sending a link out to all of the attendees with, with that link, as well as instructions as to how to uh, take the post-test and apply for the CME credits. Great. And the other question is about receiving a, a certificate. So I think it's the same idea. Yep, and we'll be following up with folks that um, complete the post-test with additional information about that. So more to come. Any other questions? I don't have any more right now. We can wait a minute. Um, while people are maybe typing or, or putting in questions, um, Again, I wanted to bring up about the Academy of Breastfeeding Medicine. So um, they have, besides the protocols that you um, that I mentioned about tongue tie, they have sample hospital breastfeeding protocols. They have protocols for hypoglycemia and hypo uh, breastfeeding with surgery or, or um, uh, you name it. They pretty much have it. Um, breastfeeding and low milk supply, et cetera. And they're constantly updating those. So I do encourage everyone, if they haven't already uh, explored that website and the protocols, uh, they can be very, very useful. I use them all the time. Dr. Silver, this is Amy um, Resnick. Uh, another question for you. Uh, do you feel that looking for tongue tie and evaluating for it should be standard evaluation for every breastfed baby, or do you feel that people should evaluate and assess for it only after they're seeing difficulties or issues such as infants not staying on the breast or infants who are uh, mothers who are having a soreness? It's a good question. Um, you know, the problem is it's, it's often a self-fulfilling prophecy, and I see that a lot in moms and newborns, is that they're anxious and they want it to succeed. And so they hear some well-meaning physician, nurse, lactation consultant saying, oh, there may be a bit of a tongue tie. And then they just glom onto that as the cause of every problem. So I, you know, while I think that we as physicians should look for it, um, I think we have to couch what we say to families of, you know, this probably will not be a problem, you know, or, or whatever, um, but it is something we will watch. Because, again, I don't want the parents to assume that this is the problem with the baby. So I think everybody, you know, I think every baby needs an assessment of their oral cavity, uh, but I, I think we have to watch how we say things to families, um, that unless there's problems, I don't want them to worry. Thank you. And I have another question. Um, the research study that you showed with that showed the uh, physicians not feeling, largely not feeling tongue tie causes a problem and the lactation consultants kind of being flipped and largely feeling it does cause a problem. I know yeah. that there sometimes is lots of um, disagreement in the community and somebody may be referred back to a pediatrician to check for this and assess for this, and then the, the pediatrician may get upset that people are, are bringing this up and feel that it's not an issue. Is, do you have any suggestions of how we can better work together so that um, people can work with each other rather than getting upset with each other? Yeah. Um, 
You know, I think it is a training thing, um, and so uh, that study was from almost 10 years ago, and I do think that it's starting to be a little more recognized by pediatricians. In the last kind of six, seven years, there have been several articles about it in in our standard journals uh, from the American Academy of Pediatrics and not just in the breastfeeding medicine literature. But I think we have generations of physicians that have just not learned much about breastfeeding and not learned much about tongue tie for sure. So it's going to take some time. And I think that also um, uh, that the, the training that lactation consultants get about, about tongue tie may not be as detailed as I would like it to be. Because again, I think that sometimes we look at it and we say, oh, look, we see it. But it's not always the cause of, of what's going on. So I think there needs to be education on both sides, absolutely. Looks like there's a couple more. Um, comments, uh, Carolina Pimenta mentioned I wanted to share, there are other palliative treatments for sore nipples, um, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm just looking, uh, hold on, oh right, I can expand this so I can read this better, hold on a second. Um, so there are other different com components like emollients you can use um, and some different studies that she has uh, brought out. And yes, there are things like virgin olive oil or coconut oil um, and, and other things. So uh, yes, Carolina, I agree. Um, and then Jim Ryan, hello. Uh, what are your thoughts about a diagnosis for the different types of tongue ties and the dis decision to treat them? Oh, like why? I'm assuming you're meaning, I assume that you're meaning uh, why are they subjective? I don't know. I think that um, some of the reason that they're they're so subjective is that we just haven't really set a standard for it. And then I think also because it's it's again looking at structure and function and looking at it in combination with the mom's nipples. So you know, classifying them whether I know that in the dental literature there's a slightly different classification or in the um, uh, medical literature. But um, I just think that nobody has really done enough research to, to provide a, a more standardized uh, assessment tool. So it, it needs to be done. And again, I think that assessment tool has to include looking at the mom side of things as well. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much, Dr. Silver. This was an incredible presentation, which was hopefully helpful to uh, many of the practitioners that were attending. And a reminder, this will also be made available via recording on our website. And thanks for all of you that joined us today. And I hope that you view some of our other presentations, too. Uh, we have, have a wonderful more questions. Oh. oh, we have a few more questions. Yes. Never mind. Hold on. I don't see them. Oh, wait, there they are. OK, hold on a second. Um, uh, just another comment about the importance of physicians working for, with a, um, lactation consultants as a team. And I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I think that was a duplicate. Yeah, they're both saying the same thing. And, um, and referring to the lactation consultant, if the mother baby have any breastfeeding issues, absolutely. I think that every physician uh, should have lactation consultants they can refer to, if not lactation consultants in their, in their office. That, that teamwork is so important for support of these moms. Any additional Thanks. questions? No more questions at this time. Thank Great. you so much. Well, thank you again, Dr. Silver, and thanks to all of our attendees. And I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>